You ever feel discouraged? Occasionally. You ever feel disappointed? You ever feel like life just isn't fair sometimes? <laughs> you ever feel like... You ever feel disillusioned? Like maybe it's never going to be very good? You know where you get disillusioned from? It starts with an illusion. Most of us have things we ex anticipate, want, desire, thought we're going to be, and they don't happen. Most of us live with discouragement and disappointment and disillusionment, and things are just not like we thought. Not even we are what we had hoped. Often, we are just disappointed with life. And sometimes it's really hard to, be, to have joy that the Bible talks about, and yet live in this world. The message I wanted to bring to you this morning is from the verse that's up in front of you here. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. So let's read this and then I'm going to share some things and, and then we're going to go home early. Honestly. No, you're going to your fellowship groups early. So here's what Paul says. Being confident of this very thing that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it, will accomplish it until the day of Christ comes. Let's read that again. Paul said he is confident of this thing, that God will finish what he starts. I'm going to tell you this morning that joy comes from confidence. The problem most people have is in what they are confident about. See, some people look for joy in this world and somehow that this world is going to give them the sense of joy, a sense of purpose. And confidence comes from their abilities. You know what the problem with confidence is? I love this one. I have no idea what the commercial is about. There are very few commercials I watch. Most everything I watch, I uh, record early so I can skip all the commercials. But every once in a while, I get to watch a commercial. I love this one commercial. There's this, uh, uh, there's this um, former basketball player. Somebody is putting make I don't even know what they're doing. Some lady's putting stuff on him and dressing him up. And he's having a vision of what it would be like back in the NBA playing again. And he thinks, I can do this. I can do this. And he's talking to himself. And he has such great confidence. And then he jumps up. And as he jumps up, he realizes his knees are really bad. And he sits back down. And he said, well, I, I could. But he can't. The joy of his life was playing basketball. And he can't do it any longer. Look, at, look, look with me at Psalm 16 and verse 11. So turn, turn to Psalm 16 and verse 11. So I think that everyone in the world is looking... Well, we have it in the preamble to our Constitution, don't we? The pursuit of happiness. As if that is the Christian pursuit. It has never been the Christian pursuit. But it is certainly the pursuit of America. And America has done its, its best to pursue happiness. And to tell you that's what your goal should be. To be happy. To buy things. To do things. To accomplish things. All about being happy. But listen to what David writes in Psalm 16 and verse 11. Thou wilt make known to me the path of life. In the presence is in thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand there are pleasures forever. Now you need to read that again. You will make known to me the path of life. You'll show me the path of life, God. And in your presence is fullness of joy in your hand there are pleasures forever now I think about that verse and the joy that we experience in this world 
The significant difference in that joy? One of the differences is the length of that joy. The joy of this world is temporary, isn't it? There was great fear earlier in the week. But she was fine. And there was great joy. But it's gone. You do well in something at school, kids. You ever do well at school, kids? My grandkids are over there. You ever do well in school? Do something good. And all of a sudden, you just feel good. It just feels good. Laura, when you pass a test, feels good, doesn't it? Do all that studying and you pass? It feels good. And then it's gone. The joy the world offers us is very fleeting. It doesn't last. It doesn't, ma doesn't make it. I got the job done this week. I did the task after seven years, finally did it. It was all done. I looked at that. I made it work because it's not pumping right now. There's no water. And I made it run and I thought, yes, it works. And then I turned around and thought, oh, now I've got to clean up. That joy was very short-lived. Joy is very short-lived in this world. And yet people pursue it with every part of their being. Most of the world we live in is dishonest. First about what they're pursuing and then secondly about how they get there. They really believe that science is going to get them joy, pleasure, satisfaction, fulfillment. But the honest truth is it will never give them that and anyone who is really honest about it will say that. Most philosophers today know there's a God. There has to be. Only those who have believed the lie and live according to a lie are going to say there's no God. But even in their hearts, they know better. You and I have made a decision to follow God. Amen? We're going to follow Him. Why? Well, first of all, He gave His life for us. He died for We sang earlier about Jesus dying for us. You know, when we worship, when we sing, it's not about the singing. It's about what you're saying and to whom you're saying it. God, that you would die in my place. You ought to be, when you're singing, when you are worshiping, you ought to be saying, oh God, inside you ought to be saying, oh God, that you would do this for me. That's worship. Otherwise, you're just singing songs. And that is wholly unsatisfying. But worship in Sunday is about saying, this means me. I'm singing about me. That you who are perfect would actually die for me who is imperfect. That's why we sing. That's the why we sing the words we sing. The words are important. I know you, you know, Mary Jo picks out a new song, you know, or an oldie but goody to her, you know, and she picks out this old song and you're sitting going, oh my goodness, it's Gaither. You know, I don't like Gaither. Give me some hard rock stuff. Okay. <laughs> you know, and that would be fine. But the words are the issue. I had a group one time that sang for a bunch of teenagers and they came in and they sang. I couldn't understand a word they said. Not a word of any of the songs they sang. And they sang all original songs. So we pulled him aside. Actually, Terry Veasley was there with me, and we were in an evangelism thing together. And uh, Terry Veasley and I pulled them aside, and we talked to them about the problem of their songs. The issue for Christians is in the words. What are we saying? Not what we're singing. How we're singing it. Not how great the drums are. Good job on the drums. You know, not how good the drums are. The piano. It isn't about the music. The music's entertaining. The music is enjoyable. There are all kinds of. But it's the words that matter, right? It's the words that matter. So as you're worshiping, you're focusing on what brings joy to you. That's what worship is about. You want lasting joy? Learn to worship. Because there is great fullness of joy in Him. 
And so when we talk about joy, and I am confident of this very thing, that God has finished something in me, I look at that and I say, being joyful is knowing something for sure. Now, Mary Jo and I have lived together for 44 years. I am confident she loves me. She is confident I love her. I don't have to do a lot of things to prove that. I just am kind every day. Kind and consistent every day. Don't have, don't have to spend a lot of money. She would get angry if I did. Don't have to do a lot of things. Just be <laughs> kind every day. Show you love every day. And you can have fullness of joy in your marriage. But fullness comes from God. How do you be kind every day? Well, God has to be in charge. Because fullness of joy comes in His presence. I'm confident of our relationship because I know who she is. I know who she loves. I know that she loves God. I have confidence in that. So it brings peace. It brings a calmness. You come into our house, it's pretty calm most of the time until I make a mess and don't clean it. And it's not so calm. But it's nice. It is calm. Why? Because in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. You bring God into your home. You bring God into your workplace. Everyone else can be on their own thing. But if you are in God's presence, you can have joy. It's really interesting when we talk about what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. It means he consumes how we feel. If it's not God who consumes how we feel, it will be your circumstances. It will be the people around you. It will be other things in this life. You know, Dave, uh, Paul was discouraged, wasn't he? John Mark had skipped out on him on the, on the first first missionary journey. Just left him. Just left and went home. Big baby. Went home. Couldn't handle it. Left. So Paul was a little discouraged. But you know what he did? He picked somebody else and went anyway. Because his joy was not about John Mark and others being with him. It was never about how people treated him. How in the world would Paul have ever talked about having great joy to people who knew him? He would go into Galatia. He would go into Philippi. He would go into these towns, win them to Christ, and then years later come back, and they knew him well. And he talked about joy. They knew the trouble he'd had. It's interesting, in 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about all the things that happened to him. His shipwreck, the lashings he took, the beatings by rod, all kinds of abuse he took. And yet he was still full of joy. And I told you last week in Philippians, he writes this book, in jail, in jail, in jail. I saw a jail cell in Israel that could possibly be one that he would have been in. It was a hewn out of the rock. It was in the ground. It was 12 feet down with grate over the top. No way to escape. It was horrible. It was cold. It was damp. It was miserable. And in the midst of that kind of jail, they didn't build jails like today. In that jail, he had fullness of joy. It wasn't about his surroundings. It wasn't about being discouraged. It wasn't about being distracted by things in his own life. You know, often your joy is controlled by the things that happen to you physically. You ever notice that? When my back hurts, and my back is out, and it's sore, I, I'm afraid it's going to go out so bad I'll be laying down for a week. It has done that in the past. When it starts hurting, I start feeling bad. You just start feeling bad. I feel like that all it's just complain you have stupid back I can't do anything you know it's how you feel but Paul had a thorn in the flesh he couldn't get rid of and God said I'm not taking it away from you some kind of physical problem 
We don't know what it was. It's I. Who knows? We don't know. All we know is he went to God and said, would you take care of it? And God said, no. You're going to have this because I'm going to prove my grace is sufficient for you. So did Paul go around complaining? I asked God to heal me and he wouldn't do it. I mean, how many people have you heard say that? God didn't do what I wanted. Oh, I see. We are invoking that we are now telling God what he should do. Well, Paul asked, and, Jesus, and God said, no, 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 I'm going to leave that. You're going to have that problem, and while you have that problem, I'm going to show you my grace is sufficient. And you know what? Paul goes on and writes, I have great joy. I'm in jail. Got, still got thorn, by the way, still got thorn in the flesh. Still got the problem. Still got all the situation. Still got people talking about me. Got the Judaizers telling everybody that I'm not very godly. Got people telling me my message is wrong. Got people accusing me of all kinds of things. Got people mistreating me. I got all of this happening to me, but he has great joy. Why? Because he put his joy and his focus in God. Not in the things of this world. Joy is the second in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Second one. If you think joy is, is a matter of thinking better, you are mistaken. It is not about you thinking the right things, however you will. It is about God working in your heart, producing joy. So joy becomes a byproduct. Joy is not the pursuit. We are not Americans first. We are Christians first. Americans pursue happiness. Christians pursue God. Now, how hard do people pursue happiness in this world? With every part of their being. Imagine a pro athlete. The work spent, the years spent, the money spent in being the best. Only to be finished by the time they're 35. And yet they do it. This last week I saw that uh, athletes make, how much money athletes make, you know who makes the most money last year as an athlete? Anybody? Yeah, I got an idea. Anybody know? Huh? Two soccer players were the top four. Yeah, and then Mayfield, Mayweather, Mayweather made the most, $330 million last year. Would you, would you get pummeled for that? <laughs> Would you, would you do what he did? Pursuing happiness. Muhammad Ali pursued happiness and spent most of his adult life now as a um, pretty much an invalid with Parkinson's syndrome from all the beatings. We pursue what will never bring joy. You can measure what your God is by what you pursue and what brings you joy. You see, most Christians will say, I pursue God. God is my pursuit. I, it's all about God. But that is not what makes them happy. It's life. It's the things. It's the job. It's the money. Everything they're pursuing. If I just could get out of debt, I would feel so good. Well, yes, you would, but that's not joy. And you'd say, well, if I could just have more, I could get along. Okay, maybe more money would get you more things. But that's not joy. Joy isn't dependent on the things of this world. Aristotle, interesting, I came upon a quote from Aristotle this last week that I thought was interesting. Makarios, which is this, the word for joy or blessing, is the one who is in the world, yet independent of the world. His satisfaction comes from God, and not from favorable circumstances. Aristotle. Our satisfaction comes from God, not from circumstances. And yet we pursue circumstances all the time. Your pursuit needs to be God. So I look at Paul now and go back to Philippians chapter 1 and I say, being confident, having great joy. 
I think as he looked at the Philippians, there was great joy in his heart. He was confident of something. That confidence brings joy. God's going to finish what he starts. I think of you like this. I look at your lives and I know where you've come from. I know that what God has brought you through. I know the struggles you've all had. I know the struggles of your soul. I know the things you're going through right now. Well, not everything, but a lot. And I look at the past and I think, oh my goodness. Look what God has already done. Look at it, guys. Look what he's already done in your life. My goodness. Look what he's done. Look what he set you free from. Look at the joy he, and peace he's giving right now. Look at the renewed conscience. That was amazing testimony. It was excellent. Look what God has done. Look, Thomas. Look what God has done. Tiffany, look what God has done. My goodness. Brittany, what has God done? You start looking back and seeing what you were and seeing what God has done. That's just, just a little of what he plans. So Paul says, what can I do every time I think about you guys? I have such great confidence. Not in you. In him. He says, I, he doesn't say, I have such great confidence in you because I've seen you work so hard. He doesn't say that. I have such great confidence in you because I, I see you studying your word and memorizing. That's good stuff. Do it. But my confidence is not in you. It's in him. Being confident of this one thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will finish it. Joy. Stop looking to the world for your joy. To your mate, to your children, to your job, to your bank account, and start looking to him. Look what he has already done. One of the greatest words in the Old Testament, remember. Remember. Build a tower of stones. Remember. Remember. Why? Because it brings great joy. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could just take some time and say, this is where I was 10 years ago, and this is where I am? That's joy. Look what I was. But look what God has done. Look what I used to do. And look what I'm now. That's not pride. It's not about being proud. Joy does, joy does not come from self-pride. Joy comes from confidence in God. Look what God has done. So when I look at you, I say, look what God has done. Stay with it because God has so much more. I think Paul would say and has said, you are my pride and joy. And Jesus said it on the cross. Or the Hebrew says it about Christ on the cross. But for the joy set before him, he endured. He endured the cross for you. He saw you as his joy. You are his joy. God looks at you and says, look what I did. Look down there. Look, look, look. And he's looking at you. And he's saying, look what I did. Look what I did in her. Look what I did in him. Look, look, look. I think God is in heaven full of joy over you. Over you. You're not perfect. It's not about that. It's about what he's done. You want confidence in your life? Be confident in God. He that has begun a good work in you will finish it. God's going to finish his work in you. Amen? Can you be joyful? God we are joyful because of Him. All right, let's bow our heads and let's pray.